quite an eventful week. I know I've talked to some of you and uh, quite an eventful week. <laughs> but thank the Lord we're here tonight and thank the Lord that he is here tonight. Right. Amen. Amen. I, I know no matter what that the hand of God is constantly moving and constantly directing what we are doing and what is happening in our city. And so I never worry if there's trouble. I never worry if there's issues. I, I, I don't worry about those things. I know God has them in control. I know God has everything in his hands. And so whatever it is that you're going through, whatever situations are uh, in your homes, in your workplaces, at school, whatever they may be, rest assured God has this in control. And, uh, and nothing that you're going through is going to ever destroy us never like i said i've read the end of the book i know how this ends and i know we win and so i i know as long as i stay on on the lord's side then i don't have to worry about how this thing's going to turn out for me because i know it's going to turn out for me that we win so i'm i'm excited about that the journey can be difficult. The journey can be interesting. But more than anything, it's always exciting to serve God. It's always exciting to serve God. So just glad you're all here today. Uh, amen. We're going to look at 2 Chronicles 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Lord, we thank you for the word that you have given us. We thank you for the power of this word to change our lives. We ask you, God, in this house today, Lord, anoint our minds to hear. Anoint our spirits to receive. Let us understand what the Spirit is saying to the church today, God, and let us grasp it. Let us use it, God. Let it become inside of us a living thing, God, that we might obey it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I, I want to uh, continue our series on prayer. So uh, tonight I've entitled uh, this lesson on prayer, um, Seek My Face. So this is our, our third lesson that I've, I've taught so far, and I, I want to continue in this because I really believe this is something God is really trying to key in for us as a church that God wants to lead us in. Um, I feel that this is his pathway for, for us. There is so much power that is in prayer. It's incredible. If you read some of the different books of people that have been prayer warriors and what God has done in their lives through prayer, it's incredible. But this is the way. Prayer is the way that we entreat God on our behalf. We talked in our first lesson about prayer and the, the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples um, the approach that we come to God in is in reverence and in humility and in, uh, in repentance, that, that spirit of repentance. And we've talked at length about the spirit of repentance, but we, be, we, we come to that in, in that reverence and we begin by in, in that prayer by worshiping God, um, exalting Him. Then we seek God's will and His kingdom in our life and in the lives of those around us and in our city, and then we ask for our needs. And then we finished in week two, uh, lesson two, we talked about the praying with fervency and praying with consistency. So we finished the prayer, which is we ask God to forgive us. And it's a very important thing. We, we, we need to be clean in our lives and clean in ourselves, but... 
there's a contingency that in that prayer that we have to understand that God says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So there has to be a cleansing of our heart of all bitter, of all malice, of all unforgiveness, of all offense. You, you can't carry around offense in your heart and you can't carry around offense in your life and pray. You can't do it. Jesus taught that many times. If you've got ought against your brother, don't, don't come up to me with the sacrifice. You leave your sacrifice on the altar. You go make it right with your brother, and then you come back and you finish this because there's no need or no, uh, there's no benefit that you'll get from doing anything as long as there is offense and ought in your life. So that's just a big thing with Jesus. That's a very big thing that if we come to prayer, we can't have grudges. We can't have... We can't, we, we can't have something that we're upset at and, and mad over and with somebody. Okay, so if there's an issue, take care of it. That's what the Bible says. And so we, for, we forgive others of all of their offenses, and, and then we worship God at the end of that prayer, but then the, we talked about the persistence in prayer. It, it, it is God's desire that if you have a need, that you bring that before him. And it's okay to be persistent in bringing that need to God. There is one need I bring before God every time I kneel, and that is our church and our city. And I bring that every time. And so uh, persistency in prayer. In, in doing this, we are coming with the right approach. We are seeking God's intervention, and we are looking to Him as our source of uh, of need and our, our source of strength. If, if anything's going to be done, it's going to be done by our God. Amen. We come knowing and understanding that it's not in us, it's not in our wisdom, it's not in our power, it's not in our intellect, it's not in our money, it's not in anything that we have that's going to fix the situations in our life. We need to lean upon God. Amen. Okay? So we need to lean upon God. That's that's the persistence, that's the necessity of prayer. And so it is a necessity that we pray. Prayer is what gets things done. There has never been a revival. There has never been a great work of God. There has never been anything done that didn't have a foundation of prayer. Now, they, they could worship all they want, they could have great music. There could be great preaching. There could, there could be all kinds of great things that would happen and, and be a part of it. But if it was going to have any effect, if it was going to last, if it was going to have impact, then it was founded by prayer. If there was no prayer, then all you did was have a nice big show. And so prayer is the foundation of everything that happens in the kingdom of God. And so prayer is our foundation. Prayer was a huge foundation of the early church. Read the book of Acts, and you'll be blown away at how many times it says that they prayed. Acts 1 and 24. It says, and they prayed and said, Lord, thou knowest the hearts of all men. Show whether of these two are chosen. In, in trying to find a replacement for, uh, for Judas, they prayed and they asked God for direction on that. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken. Not while they were worshiping, not while they were preaching, but as they were in the midst of prayer, God moved in a powerful way. Acts 8.15, who when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. It was, it was through the prayer. It was the times that they were praying over those people that the power of the Holy Ghost fell on, on those people. And so I could go on and on and on with the many verses of the early church and how that they were founded upon prayer. In fact, it was not a worship service. It was not during preaching. It wasn't at, at a time of, of celebration that the Holy Ghost fell in the upper room. They were in prayer. And, and then the Holy Ghost fell on them. And so prayer, prayer's just, it, it's a foundation of, uh, it's a foundation, 
foundational principle of the New Testament church. <clears throat> if there is any foundation to the Christian walk, it is prayer. It's prayer. If you go to a Catholic church, they pray. They do. You, you go to a Baptist church, and they pray. You go to a Methodist church, they pray. You go to any denomination, and they will have a prayer. Whatever it may be, recital, um, a, the same thing they say over and over again, whatever it is, it is what they consider a prayer. And so you don't go to any religious organization. Even going outside of Christianity to other religions, prayer is a foundation of everything that happens in that. We pray because we have issues. Every one of us have issues in life. Nobody is going to be born and live their whole life in Disney World. It won't happen. Even in Disney World, you can find some pretty grumpy people standing in those lines trying to get on those rides. So you're just not going to ever find that Disney perfect. We will always find ourselves with issues that trouble us or threaten our security, whatever it might be. There's always going to be issues that you're dealing with or somebody else is dealing with. Anybody in this house today trouble-free right now? Absolutely no trouble, no issues in your life? Look at all the hands. <laughs> it's good. You, you do have those moments. But it's not going to stay that way. Trust me. I, 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 I know that life has issues. Because we have these issues, we have been, been given prayer as an answer to the issue. Prayer is the answer to the issue. Yes. You got an issue? I, I love that old song. I'm going to say it, and, and it's going to get stuck in your heads, but um, there's that old song, Take It to the Lord in Prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Are we troubled anywhere? I can't remember the rest of the song, but it's Take It to the Lord in Prayer. And so... It, that's, that's what we're supposed to do is go to the Lord in prayer in these issues. Psalms 88, verse 13. But unto thee have I cried, O Lord. In the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. I, I'm going to get up in the morning. This is David. I, I'm going to spend my time. I am crying out to you, God, in prayer in the mornings. Isaiah 55 and verse 6, this is God speaking. He says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Pray. Seek God. Reach out to him in your time of need. Ephesians 6 and 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Pray, pray. Pray, pray. It, it is what the church does. It is, it is what you find throughout the Bible. It is, it is something that in every person that you read that is in the Word of God that has been a man of God or a saint of God of any kind, you'll find that they prayed. That they prayed. Cornelius got the attention of God because he prayed. And he gave. Sounds like two things God has given to this church. Two things God has spoken to this church about. Giving and praying. Those two things Cornelius got the attention of God and sent angels on his behalf. And salvation came to his whole family. And so prayer, prayer, prayer. There are things that we want to see accomplished in our city. We as a church have had a great passion to see our city come to the understanding of the gospel plan of salvation. We want to see people baptized 
in Jesus' name. We want to see people be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There are many kids in this city, many teens in this city, many adults in this city, many, uh, many of the uh, elderly in this city that need to be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Spirit. And God is desiring to do that. We as a church desire to do that. We want to see people set free from addiction. Yes. I don't know if you know people personally that are addicted. I don't know if you know someone personally that is struggling with whatever it might be. But in this city, it is rampant. Yes. And it is, it, it is our passion as a church to reach out to those in our city and watch them be set free. Uh, our, our city has a very... Uh, a very strong undercurrent that you don't see, uh -huh. but it's there, yeah. of drug addiction. Yeah. We, we've got marijuana shops all around us. I, uh, Sister uh, Whitley, when she was here, um, she made mention of at, at how surprised she was at how many marijuana shops we have. It, it's like they just are everywhere in our community. If you drive from Kenai to Sterling, there, there are probably 30 marijuana shops in that area. It's just one after another. And, and the opiate use that is in our city, you don't see it, but it is there. Prescription drug addiction and prescription drug abuse in our city is overwhelming. It's there. And so we want to see these things gone. We want to see... Homes healed. There are marriages falling apart in our city today. There are people that are on the brink of divorce. There, there are families that are being split up. We want to see homes healed, and we want to see marriages put back together. We want to see our teens that are set free of depression and anxiety and self-loathing and anorexia. There, there, is, there is something that is going on against our youth of this city. It is very strong. It is very strong. The young ladies are feeling so pressured to fit a certain image and a certain mold that they are abusing their own bodies. They are doing things to themselves so that they can appear in a certain manner, in a certain way. People are, the, the youth of our city are dealing with suicide very strongly. It's a very strong pressure that is against them. We have got to be a church that stands in the gap and says, not in this city. Not in this city. We don't want that in our city. Honestly, as a pastor of this church, I am, I am consumed with seeing our city healed. It is something that consumes me. We have got to see our city healed. We have got to see this stuff gone from our city. We, we, th these things have got to go away. We cannot have another person in this city become addicted to prescription drugs or opiates or marijuana. We can't have another teen commit suicide. We can't put up with another divorce. We cannot have these things in our city. We can't. And so we, we, we've got to see these things um, healed and, and, and we've got to see these things taken care of. And so we ask the question, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Can, can you not look into your neighborhood? Can you not look into the people that you know? Can you not look into your own family, those around you? Can, can you not look into, into your own uh, friends and acquaintances and co-workers and see the very things that are destroying our city working in their lives? Sometime, some way, we got to wake up and we got to say there is a cause. There is a reason for us to act. There is a reason for us to get up and get some, get some, some fire in us and get some passion in our own lives and get some passion in what we're doing to make a difference. 
And so there, there is a cause. There, there is a reason for us to do that. That is our rallying cry. That is, that is uh, as we look at those issues that are facing our city, this is, this is our rallying cry. This is a, a cause that we, will, that we will take a hold of. If we don't get a passion for our city, if we don't get a passion, who is going to? Is our government going to take care of it? Is the city council going to do this? Is it going to be done by the police officers? Should we worry about the jails and our, our prisons to make sure that these people are taken care of and that when they come out they're never going to go into that again no my friend it's not going to happen that way it's not going to happen if we don't do something no one else is going to it's not the responsibility of the policeman it's not the responsibility of the city council it is the responsibility of the church it is the responsibility of the church I, I, and it, we're not just an organization that gets together on a Thursday and a Sunday, holds our little, uh, our little fun gathering together, worships God, hears some preaching, shakes each other's hand, eat a, a meal and go home. That is not what we're about. That is not why God uh, put his church on this earth. That is not why he gave the earth the church. That is not the plan of God for us just to be our little cloistered group and not make an effect. If you read the Bible, every time that a church was planted in a city, it turned the city upside down. The church is meant to affect the city, and the church is meant to be the healing salve for the city of, that is in sin. And so that's our responsibility. What has to be done cannot be done through legislation or self-help. Laws cannot be passed to remove drug addiction. You, you can pass all the laws you want, make it as illegal as you want, and you're not going to get rid of drug addiction. Five-step programs cannot free people from their fear and anxiety. And there is no program that is going to help these issues. These are spiritual matters, and they have to be met with spiritual answers. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Our city needs Jesus. We have to have Jesus move. We have to have Jesus heal, and we have to have Jesus deliver. There has to be a supernatural manifestation of the power and the presence of our God in our city. What I'm talking about is the kingdom of God in our city. We've got to have the kingdom of God in our city. So God has led us to repent for our city. I'm going somewhere with this message. Keep going. Keep following me. God has led us to repent for our city. So Mondays, we're out there on the front lawn, and we are in repentance for the, for the city. I, I want to thank all of you that have been a part of, of gathering together on Monday at 7 o'clock and being out there. And, and praying over our city, repenting for our city. I, I want to thank you. This is voluntary. I, 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 I told the uh, MIT class last night, I said, if nobody goes and just pastor goes, pastor's going out there. Because, because this is something that I'm going to do. And so I thank you for coming, and I thank you for partnering with me on this, because it's very powerful. You see, we see the cause we understand the need, but we are willing to do something about it. We are acting because we do see the cause. We do understand what needs to be done. You are standing in the gap for the people of this city. You're standing in the gap for the people of this city. Somebody has to bridge the gap between God and man. Yes. Paul said it this way. Jesus came to reconcile man unto himself. He wanted man to come back to him. But then he left. And the Bible says that he gave the ministry of reconciliation 
to us. To us. That, that means you, Crystal. That means you, Juanita. That, that means every person in this place was given the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? That means you're the person in the middle between the sinner and Jesus, and you are here to reconcile them together. You know where he is. You know how to get to him. You know the way of salvation, and you know the gospel truth. And so God set you in the middle to reconcile a lost city with a saving Savior. You were, you were made to, to bring those two together. You're giving the, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And so kids, you have a ministry of reconciliation. And so we're trying to get a bus ministry. We, we want a bus ministry to go. You, you know who would be so powerful in a bus ministry? Our kids. All of our kids. You know how kids can be powerful in a bus ministry? Get on the bus, but invite your friends. It, 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 you know kids, hey, you want to come to Sunday school? Man, we'll pick you up. Wherever you're at, you have, a, you have a great opportunity to invite and to bring. You, 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 are, you, you can't believe, or you can't imagine. You can't imagine what kind of effect that you will have. When the prices were here, uh, Stephen, how many kids did Stephen bring? A bunch. One kid. What did he do? He played with a bunch of kids and said, hey, you guys want to come to church? What did they say? Yeah. It, it, it can be done. It, it can be done. You got a bunch of friends. You, you, you got a bunch of kids that you hang around with. Come on, come to church with me. It's fun. And so we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's my point, is you know how to get to Jesus. They don't. And so we've been, we've been given that. So you stand in the gap for these people. You're called to repent for our city. That repentance is affecting our city. I, I don't know what it's doing. I don't understand what it's doing. I, 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 I've been praying about this, and, and I'm just telling you right now that what we're doing, we're not doing for the purpose of winning the city, okay? That is what we hope. That is what we want. But what we're doing is we're repenting because God asked us to do that. We're doing it out of obedience to God with no restrictions, with no preconceived notions that, Lord, we'll do this, but you've got to, and this is what's going to happen. That was not a part of the deal. God simply said, I want you out on the front lawn, and I want you repenting for the city. So that is what we're going to do. Irregardless of what happens, we're there in obedience to the word of God, seeking to repent for our city. Why? Because we care about our city and because we love our city, because we don't want these things to happen. I don't know about you, but I sat in the living room of a mom and a dad whose son had just committed suicide in the back bedroom. He was dead in the back bedroom. I sat there trying to console a mom and dad over a son in his early 20s who had put a gun to his head and shot himself. Now, my friends, I don't ever want to do that again. I, I don't ever want to have a part of that again. And so because we care and because we love our city, we're going to repent. We're going to repent for our city. <clears throat> that was a powerful key that God gave us in our first night of revival with Brother Hernandez. Yes. The power of repentance. Man, when he preached that message, I, I, I wanted to get up and run and shout because of what my mind just blew up when he was preaching that to us. What an amazing thing. That repentance is not about the extraction of. Because we always look at 
we want to repent so that sin is extracted from us. But no, repentance has a power. It is a key to unlocking a door. It, it is about a change of mind, a change of mode, a change of, of our direction. It doesn't have to do with sin. It could be about the way that God wants you to do certain things in your life or whatever it might be. It's not sin. It's just a redirection for you. It's coming to God and saying, God, lead me and direct me in everything that I do. Help me to know what it is that you want me to do. Now, God's not going to get tell you that uh, these are the clothes you're going to wear, and, and, and this is where you're going to go at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and 12 o'clock. That, that normally, I, I'm not saying God can't do that, but normally that's not what God is going to do. What, what God is going to do is he's going to start redirecting you on some simple things in your life. He's already done it on me. And so it's, it's a matter of repentance and saying, God, I'm willing to change any way that you want. I come to you. I come to you humbly, and I come to you in the spirit of repentance. And so... It was through that revelation that we have made the changes to what we are doing now. Repenting so that there are, is a change in the direction of our city. We want the direction of our city to change. Right. Not just removal of sin, because you can remove the sin, but if the, if the direction doesn't change, it has done no good. Right. You can get a drug addict off of drugs. You can... Take somebody and put their marriage back together. You can do those things, but if you don't change the direction, they're still lost. And so we're, we're after a change of direction. We're after a change of direction. Changing the way we think, changing our approach to God, and changing our perspective of what we think God is going to do. That's what we're doing. That is repentance. We are learning this. We are learning this, and it is changing this church. <laughs> it is changing this church. We, we, are, we are going, God asked us to make a step up. Did he not? And this is what God is leading us to step up in. This, these are the things that God is saying. Here's a few steps that I want you to do, and this is one of them. I want you to learn to walk in the spirit and life of repentance that your repentance would be not just the god forgive me of my sins but god lead me and guide me i come to you direct me whatever it is that you want in my life it's a powerful key for unlocking great things the second night that's what i want to key on tonight so i've gone through the second night sermon from brother hernandez i read through that whole transcript and so if you don't know, the, both first and second night transcripts are back there on the back. And you can get them and read through them, and I highly recommend you do that. But I have gone back through that second night, and it has blown me away. It, it has just, wow. First night was wow. Second night, my friend, it was wow. Spelled backwards, whoa. Whoa. It was, it was, wow. When I first sat in that sermon, it was so deep that as you, I struggled to grasp everything that he was saying. It was like, okay, I'm still chewing on this and there's so much coming at me that I just, I can't swallow all of this. And so I, I understood what God was teaching us, but only on a surface level because of what Brother Hernandez was teaching was so deep. And so I want to take a moment and I want to expound on this so that we can tie in this next great key that God has given us for affecting our city and seeing the move and the hand of God that we desire. Remember, we are seeking God to affect our city, right? I, I love you, I care about you, and I'm thankful for this church. I want this church to grow. I want you to grow. But as a church, our desire is to see this city changed. Okay? And so the second night, the first night was a key to changing our lives, changing 
our modes and changing us. The second night was a key to changing our city. I want to talk to you about that. It's powerful what he was talking about. And so the key is found in the scripture that we opened with, and this was the scripture Brother Hernandez preached from, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Now, the, the context, i got to give you the context of this passage. The context of this passage is the dedication of the temple. Solomon has completed the building and is in the process of dedicating this temple to God. That's what Solomon is doing. All the sacrifices have been completed, and Solomon has prayed over the nation. The nation of Israel at this time is at its pinnacle of religious and national strength. David, who was the king before Solomon, he had gone and he had conquered all of the lands. He, he had absolutely destroyed the Philistines, the Amorites, the Hittites, the, the Jebusites, the Mosquito Bites, the, all of them. He got rid of all of them. And he built the, the, the nation of Israel great wealth. He, he got all kinds of money from all of these nations that he conquered. And when he passed away, he left for Solomon a kingdom that had been completely established. There was no war, no need for war. Great peace in the days of Solomon. Very much wealth in the days of Solomon because of what David did. And so they, they religiously were a very strong people, very religious because David had been a man after God's own heart and had established worship and praise. And man, I'm telling you, the nation itself had great religion and great nationalism. They, they were a, a very strong people, both nationally and towards God. So Solomon inherits this kingdom. Solomon builds the temple. And Solomon sacrifices all of these sacrifices unto God. He does all of these things. And so Solomon, in his prayer, he understands that things are not always going to be like they are. Solomon is sitting right now in the perfect Disneyland. Okay? Everything's good. They're not at war. There's no famine. They're not poor. They're not subjugated to another kingdom. They are very well off. And so he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, 24 through verse 27, he says, if, if thy people Israel be put to the worst before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall return and confess thy name, and pray and make supplication before thee in this house, then hear thou from heaven, and forgive the sins of thy people, and bring them again into the land which thou gavest, uh, gavest to them and to their fathers. When the heavens is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, yet if, thy, if they pray towards this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sins when thou dost afflict them, then hear thou from heaven, and forgive the sins of thy servants, and thy people Israel, when thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain upon the land which thou hast given unto thy people for inheritance. And so this is just a portion of a very lengthy prayer that Solomon prayed. And he said, when they make a mistake, their life is great now, but it won't be that way. The nature of man is, is, is to do stupid things. And when, when, when this nation falls and does something stupid and you judge them, then, oh God, would you hear from heaven? Would you look upon them as they repent, as they fall on their face before you, as they're there? Would you reach out, God, and would you take them and help them in, in, in the times that they pray unto this place? And so Solomon uh, looked for that. He, he said, don't forget this place and don't forget the offerings that are done here. Please look at this place and your people and forgive them when they trespass. And so the prayer 
was that God would take a people that were rebellious, sinful, and under the judgment of God and return them unto himself. The prayer was that God would accept repentance and that he would restore them. A people that were lost in sin, that God would redeem them back to himself. That was the prayer of Solomon. Okay? Then God answered Solomon's prayer. Okay? Solomon is asked, when they do this, then God, would you do this? God replies to Solomon, 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 14. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Here is the absolute key that God is trying to help us here in Soldatna to understand concerning our prayers for our city. Okay? We want our city to turn. We want our city delivered. We want our city saved and walking in purity and walking in holiness. This is the key that God is trying to help us to understand. We need... The need is so very obvious to God. He understands what is going on in our city. He knows every sin and he knows every situation. God knows the issues. God knows the spirits that are active on binding the people and influencing the people. God fully sees everything. And so it's not a question if God sees. It's not a question of whether or not God will act for the people. That's not the question. But there is an issue that, is, that God is trying to get his people to see. You see, and this was the point that Brother Hernandez was talking about. We focus on the extraction of the sin. That's what we're focused on. We're focusing on the extraction of the sin. We want God to extract the sin. We pray and seek God to remove depression, to remove anxiety, to remove addiction, to remove all of these things. We want things removed. We want God's hand to act for us. Are you following me? You know somebody that's going through something, and so you begin to pray and ask God to remove this, and you're binding spirits, and you're doing things, okay? That, that, that's, we're asking God to do that. We want God's to ha hand to act for us. It was the issue that caused the pain and moved us to prayer. We want the hand of God to sweep through the city and deliver we want the hand of God to move and release the bonds and the chains of the sin. We are looking to have things removed and things repaired. We pray for those things specifically. We ask for those things specifically. But God is saying, if you will humble yourself and seek my face. He did not say, if you will humble yourself and begin to pray that I would send the rain, begin to pray that I would remove the Amorites, begin to pray that I would take away things. He did not say in here at all that you would pray that anything would be taken away. But what he said was, if you will humble yourself and if you will seek my face. The first thing God asked is that the people humble themselves. If you humble yourself, you will change the way that you pray. If you humble yourself, the way that you pray is going to change. If you humble yourself, you lose consciousness of yourself. 
When you humble yourself, you are not thinking about you anymore. Pride is self-centered. It's about my needs. It's about my issues. It's about what I am going through. Humbleness removes your needs and your desires. Humble yourself before you begin to pray. Strip away all of the things that are about you self-centeredly. Forget your needs and your wants. And then seek my face. This is the key that we have got to get. I'm trying to drive home what Brother Hernandez was trying to bring to us, that God is saying, seek my face. We too often seek the hand of God. We want the hand of God to act. We want the hand of God to move. We want the hand of God to do something. God is saying, stop seeking my hand and start seeking my face. Stop seeking my hand and stop and start seeking my face. Turn your attention in your prayers from you to me. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face. If you'll seek his face. We want all those things gone. Israel. And and Solomon's prayer, God, if they do this and you do this to them, then when they turn to you, God, and they pray before you, God, then would you remove those things that you did? That was Solomon's prayer. When God answered Solomon, he did not answer Solomon as Solomon requested. What he said to Solomon was, yes, I'll do it, but this is the way that it's got to happen. You're going to have to humble yourself. What I'm asking you to do is quit thinking about yourself and quit thinking about your needs. What I want you to do is lose yourself and begin to put me as the center of everything that is in your life. You give yourself to me. It doesn't matter, God, if you remove the pain in my life. Life. It doesn't matter, God, if I get healed from this disease. It doesn't matter, God, if this issue goes away. I have humbled myself, and I am seeking your face, God. I'm not after the removal of all of these things. I'm not after you, God, to do all of these things for me. But the thing that I want more than anything, God, is I want you. I want you. God is teaching this church. Hear me. God is teaching us a way of prayer. And God said, if you will do that, if you'll turn from your wicked ways, it's not just seeking after me. It's not just hungering after me. It's then a turning from your wicked ways. But these things have to come. There wasn't one part of that prayer, not one part of what God said for us to do that said for us to ask specifically that these things be gone. What God said was, seek my face. Seek my face. As I read through that transcript, man, that popped up so big and so powerfully to me. God is trying to get us to understand that when we come to him in prayer, it's not about seeking God to do all of these things. And I have got to change the way that I pray. Because when I come before God, I am constantly on my face before him. And, and I, I, am, I am absolutely consumed about seeing this church grow. And I want it to grow. And I have preached to you about consistency in prayer and being specific in prayer. That is fine. That is good to do. There is no problem with that. When we read the prayer of Jesus that he taught to the apostles, there was a portion in it where we we, we ask of God for our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. There's needs that we've got to have. But God is teaching us, our church, for this time being right now, and we got to start changing the way that we pray. Uh-huh. And we got to seek God. 
And God, if you don't give us any souls in this city, if this is all we get, then God, I am going to love you with everything that I got. I am going to give myself to you with everything that I have. I am going to love you and worship you. It is not contingent upon how many people that we baptize each year. My joy in him will not be contingent upon how many people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Success of this church will not be measured about how many people people are in it. The success of this church will be in how much we seek after the face of Jesus. That's what God is calling us to, church. I, 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 can't, I can't massage this message any other way. I can't go into any more, any more examples for you. I can't bring out any more illustrations because it's just this simple fact that when God said to Solomon, I'll do the things that you want me to do, I will take care of the needs. But it's not because you prayed for those needs to be done. It's because you humbled yourself, you sought my face, and you turned from your wicked ways. Now we are in prayer for this city. You and I are, fa- are, are on our face and many of us are fasting and praying that God would reach this city. But what God is asking us to do is repent for this city. That's the first thing that we're trying to get in this city is a humbling that the people of this city would stop looking at themselves and their needs and begin to realize that the real need that they have is to seek the face of Jesus. So we have to intercede. And we've got to be the bridge between God and this city. We've got to be the ones to go on our face before God yeah. and humble ourselves uh-huh. and, and, and seek the face of God ourselves. We have got to do that. Yes. Yes. The city will never rise above the church. It will never be more holy than the churches. It will never be more righteous than the churches. <coughs> Whatever is in the church is going to be in the city. It'll be to that level. We will lead the city. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And so God is teaching us to do these things so that as we do these things, they will affect the city. They will affect the city. Do you want to heal the land? Then this is what God is calling this church to do. We seek the face of God. We've got to seek the face of God. We cannot become complacent in our walk with Jesus. We cannot get to the place where it's just another Thursday night. It's just another Sunday afternoon. And we're just going to hear a little preaching, some songs. No, my friend, it's got to consume us. We as a people, God is saying, I want you to go up higher. I want you to make that next step. I want you, God is saying to us, I have fed you with milk, but I am feeding you with meat now. If there's ever been a time that we have been swallowing meat, meat it is right now it's right now and God is saying I want to feed you with that but this is what I'm requiring of you and this is what I'm asking of you God is saying seek my face I I want drug addiction gone from this city I want marriages put back together I want people baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost I will continue brother Aaron I will continue to pray and ask God for souls in this city but I will not seek souls above him. That's right. That's right. I, I will not treasure souls above him. Right. There, there, is, there is this thing that I, I read many years ago, and it, it's about um, marriage, young couples who get married. And there's this phenomenon that happens when children come into the home. And the wife sometimes will be so caught up with the kids, the child, that the husband is neglected. And that intimacy and that relationship between the husband and the wife is not there because the wife, what she wanted so desperately was these children. And those children become her life. And the husband is pushed aside. And so God brought that back to me and he said, are you seeking children more than you're seeking me? Who who started this relationship? Where did it begin? What is the primary relationship in this? Is it you and the the kids? 
you and the souls that are being saved, or is it you and me? It's you and me, God. It's you and me, God. Yes, we want the city saved. Yes, we want those things. But we, we, we have got to focus. God is saying, I want you to focus. Seek me. Seek me. Every family in this church, seek me. When you go home and you have your devotions with your family, you seek God. You seek him. You humble yourself in your home. You pray. You seek the face of God. When we get together here in this church, we humble ourselves. We, we put away all of our wants and all of our needs, and we're here to praise him. I, I, I mean, if ever God has been speaking to us, he has been speaking to us very strongly on that. Do you remember Brother Whitley's message to us? Brother Whitley spoke to us about that very specifically. He said, we come in here sometimes because we want God to do for us, but that's not the purpose of coming to church. We come to church because we are to give glory and honor and praise unto him. We, we cannot use the church as our place where we just come to get our needs met. We need to come into this place with our mind and our heart set on God. I have come here today to glorify you, to praise you, to worship you, to exalt you i will seek the face of god can we stand tonight i don't have any idea where i am on my notes but i'm here to tell you that this is what god is speaking to us can we gather around the front This is the key that Brother Hernandez was speaking to us as a church. This was a very strong key that he was trying through the power of the Holy Ghost 